artists do have that ability to just follow an interest, to follow a curiosity. They know how to sort of find that next step forward in whatever the project is. And I think that's a difference where doctors can really learn from artists. Hello and welcome to Art Goes On, a podcast featuring art people on how they keep the art world running. Here, they will share their vision of the present and a glimpse of the future. I'm your host, Pierre de Montesquieu, recording from Paris, France, so please, pardon my English. Before we start, as we try to make this show interactive, here's a quick reminder to follow our Instagram account, at AskArtGoesOn, where you'll be able to ask questions to upcoming guests. Now, on to today's show. This show was recorded on June 2020. Today, my guest is quite unusual. I'm welcoming Alexa Miller, who is the founder of Arts Practica, a consulting company that teaches art observation to healthcare practitioners. Hi, Alexa, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's so great to be with you. So, Alexa, How art is going for you? <laughs> uh, it's an interesting time. It's a creative time. I'd say unexpectedly more creative than I would have um, expected when the pandemic hit and there was sort of an initial period of shock. I would say I kind of made my peace with it and it became a time of doing a lot more gardening and um, waking up early to be working on my writing but it it has also been a time of really like the fierce burning desire to continue making has is something i have supported so i've signed myself up for a class that i have been wanting to do for a really long time and i also gathered a small group um of friends from disparate corners of my life who are um makers of one form or another Uh, to meet weekly um, and just check in on our art practice and our creativity. And I'm not sitting at the drawing table and making a lot of drawings and paintings like I thought I might, but it is a time of very intense making in my writing life and in my interpersonal life, especially with everything that is happening politically in America right now. So it's, it's an intensely creative time, but I would say there's not sort of one central project. There are a lot of different projects, but it's, it's good. It's, it's sort of tiring and I can't wait to travel again. In, in my professional life, I travel a lot and not traveling has been um, really hard on my soul and on my brain. I really live for having a lot of exposure to like different places and different ways of being. And I live in a sort of rural place and I love traveling to places where there's more of a immediate connection to like the global economy. And so that's been, that's been hard, but yeah, it's, it's a creative time. Your background is in art. You started as an artist before switching to consultancy in healthcare. Could you go back to that and tell us how you came up to what you're doing now? Sure. So um, I grew up, I was one of those kids who was just always drawing. And that was really important to, um, I think that was really important to my sanity, really, as, as a kid. I grew up in a house that was very noisy And drawing was my way of sort of building a field around myself where I could have quiet and stillness and focus. And it also, I, I was really lucky. I went to a really wonderful high school and I had incredible art instruction at a young age. And I, very young, I got to the point where I could like really draw anything and learn observation, drawing, you know, making you know, spending hours every week just drawing something through deep looking and learning how to really see what is there, how to break it down, how to abstract it and represent it. It was a set of skills that I was focused on young. And I can, and even though I'm not engaged in a rigorous drawing and painting practice now, 
that skill set of being able to just look at what's there and look for structures and look at how to sort of simplify what I'm seeing is something I'm drawing on all the time. And that's a part of what I teach as well. Um, but I, yeah, I studied art history. I, I learned in college that I, I continued to make art, but I also learned like I just loved to write about art. And I loved the exchange of perspectives of different ways of seeing that would come out of dialogues about art. And I got really enthusiastic about that. I did study painting after college. I had kind of a wacky track. I also had a very unsuccessful year as a graphic designer at an educational textbook company. Actually, the day they had me Photoshop a penis off of a giraffe for an educational book was the day I quit that job. <laughs> but when I, I studied art, uh, I had this wonderful year in London studying painting. And that was shortly after 9-11. And it was a strange time to be a foreigner. And all of the things I thought I wanted to study in art just kind of completely unraveled very quickly. And uh, it was at that time I really started to focus on human resilience and our ability to adapt and to carry narratives within us and to see other narratives in others. So I started exploring that in a painting project, which brought me into the space between art and medicine because I began doing research on medical texts to inform my painting process. I was in London at the time and there's a really incredible uh, image archive and public health resource called the Wellcome Trust there. So. Um, I started doing a lot of research in their medical library, and that was when I uh, realized I was very passionate about the medical learning process and how doctors see. And um, I was looking at all of these medical images, and I could notice that I could see a lot in the images simply as an artist with drawing training that was not like actually described in the text. And for me, it's sort of like connected back to a passion. Uh, my, one of my siblings was very badly misdiagnosed as a child and it connected the dots back to like how if somebody had taken some time to see her more adequately and appropriately before making an inaccurate judgment, it would have been really life-changing for her and for our family. I have spent the last 20 years of my career very dedicated to helping experts, very smart people, holders of medical knowledge and the power uh, to see another person, to helping them when they enter a space where they don't know, to look and be present with what is there and to stay in that space of uncertainty uh, longer and free of preconceived ideas or limiting beliefs and able to regulate emotions, namely fear, because it's that space where people get hurt. And so I, I did that for a long time. Um, I had this really lucky break very early on in my career. Shortly after I finished art school, I was doing a bunch of odd jobs and I got into um, art museum teaching and Around that time, I, I got involved with this group of students and faculty at Harvard Medical School who wanted to start a course that taught physical diagnosis skills using arts experiences. So I did that for 10 years. We had this research study come out that showed the effectiveness of that program. I since have like consulted on other programs at other medical schools and dental schools and social work schools and nursing schools and art museums that are involved in this endeavor to help our clinical care force, you know, pursue mastery really in clinical practice around these skills of seeing. Um, and that's been incredible. And I've also um, developed my own course. It's called Looking with Uncertainty based on my research of expert diagnosticians. So the, the few, the sort of rare class of doctors who um, are able to transcend a lot of the barriers of the current healthcare system and are able to somehow really take a 
constructive pause and check their thinking and leverage the resources and seeing and perspectives of other colleagues and the patients and the families very well and be incredibly creative and constructive in this uncertainty space so as to get to more accurate diagnoses. So I spent some time actually like studying them and studying their writing and the literature around diagnosis and connecting some of those practices to things that we can learn and experience viscerally and authentically in arts experiences. So one of your main fields of studies is uncertainty. What are the commonalities between doctors and artists? Because artists are often living with doubt and often in the process of trial and error. While I guess doctors have less room for experiments and need to be confident. Yes, that's a very resonant observation. So well, there are probably lots of similarities between an artist and a doctor. And of course, I'm like speaking very generally, which is always something to be aware of. But um, I'd say most doctors that I have interacted with are in their hearts, like very creative people. And most doctors have, a lot of doctors have had a big creative life that they then had to table in order to do their training. And many doctors sort of came into medicine with the expectation that their work was going to have a lot more uh, room in it for that creativity and that up close work with patients than it actually does. And that's something that is, the, the, the current conditions are in incredibly discouraging for a lot of doctors. So right now it's, it's a real time of resilience. But with regards to that confidence, the way I would think about it has to do with intention. And artists make art for all kinds of reasons. And certainly to express themselves is one, you know, very common one. But I also think there are, you know, artists make art for all kinds of other reasons as well, you know, to, to document something really important that's happening right now, or to ask us to look at something that we don't want to see, or to look at something a different way, or to challenge us. Um, or to please us and make us feel very relaxed and peaceful, or to, you know, a lot, to talk about the art world itself. There's a lot of artwork doing that. Uh, or to just really study something, you know, to really understand and study something like the way a classical trained painter would make a portrait. And likewise, for doctors, I mean, I think that the, the, the level of intention that I am focused on are doctors who are really committed to mastery of their craft, to the service of caring for human life uh, and caring for communities. But let I me, mean, let's be honest, there's doctors are doctors for all kinds of reasons. You know, there are plenty of doctors who are doctors to have pleased their parents and then to go home at the end of the day and have a nice life. <laughs> there are doctors who are, you know, running different kinds of businesses. There are doctors who are interested in being a public voice. You know, there's, there's lots of reasons. But if I were to focus on the group that is really dedicated to mastery of the craft of doctoring and to caring for human life and sort of compare that to the kind of confidence that an artist might demonstrate, the issue of trust is really central. Because uh, in order to adequately see a patient, a doctor needs to be trusted by that patient, which will change by context. And, and the doctor also needs to be able to trust his or herself, especially when we're talking about standing in that space of the unknown. And so artists do have that, especially with regards to that self-trust and that ability to just follow an interest, to follow a curiosity, even when the rest of society is telling you, you are crazy, <laughs> or um, it doesn't make sense, and, and, or even that you don't, you yourself don't even understand, but you're called to it and you're following it. Artists do that really, really well. And that is probably one of the things that's like rolled into the training of an artist is they know how to sort of find that next step forward in whatever the project is. 
And I think that's a difference where doctors can really learn from artists. Uh, there are so many cases where uh, a doctor hits the edge of their knowledge and they don't know, you know, and it's like a wall. You know, it can be like a wall or a cliff. It can be very, that's a place where their expertise or sort of their competence might be challenged and, or their value might potentially be challenged. But uh, I mean, a lot of doctors don't disclose uncertainty because of like fear of lawsuit, but it's interesting. There's, there's actually research on this that shows that skillful disclosure of uncertainty, it's exactly the opposite effect that patients trust and are less likely to sue their doctors, you know, when, when they actually do say, I, I don't know, but here's what I see and here's what we can do. And here's what it's, it's that ability to not hit a wall, but to, um, to be present, to be authentic, to be honest, to have clear, open eyes, um, somehow to find that way forward together with a patient. And so, yes, I do believe that there is something in there that artists, a great strength that artists have that doctors can learn from. When you teach art observation to doctors, what are the artworks that you show? Is there a difference between sculpture or painting, abstract or figurative works? Every work of art, regardless the form, will elicit different kinds of responses in viewers and those responses are always unique to the individual and to the group and then there are often big commonalities or big themes that consistently get raised so it really depends i mean just basic observation you know it, it, it it's sort of hard for me to talk about the works of art that I choose because it's it's always kind of unique to that group and to the particular learning objective and um, topics of conversation that we want to raise. Um, but no, it's, it, I mean, certainly looking at paintings or photography is, is very accessible, um, but it certainly does not need to be limited to that at all. In general, I choose works of art that have elements of like the recognizable world so have a way in for people and are also puzzling or complex or have you know raise questions or have things that we can't fully know um, or might have details that are not apparent right away but take a little time to emerge that have the potential to really change what change the whole picture there's a whole big sort of like bag of tricks around what what images to show and what's available and sort of where we're going and how long we've been working together that um that come into play then how would you build your courses according to the audience do you have specific requests and what else do you do other than art observation that's a great question so um Let me answer the second part of the question first about sort of what we do other than our observation. So I feel very strongly that you can't just sort of take doctors to the art museum or to have an arts experience and then expect that they will make a very clear linkage to what it means. So, I mean, I'm, I, I, I think everybody should have as much art in their life as possible and it certainly does not always need to be structured however if we want for example doctors to be better observers or patients or we want for example doctors to be able to better observe patients who they actively don't like or if we want for example doctors to be able to recognize when they don't know and to have clear strategies around how to elicit the perspective of another person or talk through a few different possible hypotheses and hold complexity and amb ambiguity at the same time. Very clear sort of habits or what we call forcing strategies, that those, those things um, need to be sort of like deliberately conditioned and identified and, and taught. So when I'm in that kind of realm, 
I do a mix of arts-based experiences and clinical didactics. So looking at a patient case and drawing out those same strategies or sharing some of my research on the best practices that masterful diagnosticians do. That's always intermixed with the art experience itself so that they have something to apply it to or asking them to apply it you know, in, in practice with their team. And then we meet again the following week and, and talk about how that went. So um, I like to um, build in an application. I do that in all different kinds of ways, either myself or partnering with other medical faculty. Uh, and then as far as like specific works of art, I mean, I could, I could share with you a few works of art that, that um, I've used very frequently in my teaching and just like talk about some of the, some of the things that come up. Yeah, sure. Nothing better than an example. I'm ready for my first course. Okay. Um, since we were just talking about how it's important to my teaching to make a clear linkage between uh, a work of art and what comes up in a work of art and a clinical case. So why don't we, why don't we start with the Frida Kahlo painting, uh, the portrait, self-portrait with Dr. Farrell. So that's an image um, that I've used a lot over the years. And one, I, there's so much to love about it because it's at the same time, it comes across as like a very clear, linear, almost like an illustration. And at the same time, it's so puzzling. <laughs> it's like a very contained, she herself as, as a painter has been very contained sort of in her treatment of form and space and the topic. And it's at the same time sort of dealing with very raw, visceral experience of pain and her health journey. The other reason I love to choose Frida Kahlo's work is that usually with any given group, some people in the group will be able to immediately recognize, oh, that's Frida Kahlo because her work is so popular. You know, we see her image on handbags and there's a lot of Frida Kahlo memes and she painted herself so frequently. So her work is like somewhat in like the popular consciousness. Um, and then there's also always people who ha haven't heard of her, haven't seen her work before. So automatically it sets up the difference in background knowledge and people recognizing what they think they know. And art is a space of examining what we think we know, which is something that's really important for doctors to be doing at all times and is one of the sort of dangers of medical knowledge medical training, knowledge is often treated like facts, like here's what's already known. Um, but the truth is our knowledge, especially about human life and disease and the many ways in which it expresses, it's always changing. Um, and it's a lot less set than we often think it is. And it's important for doctors to recognize that, especially when they are looking at human beings with very idiosyncratic expressions of disease. And most of the phenotypes that they have learned on is, is like a really limited section of the population. So that habit of questioning what we think we know is really important for doctors in, in the art of, of diagnosis and in general, how we treat people. So I'll tell you a story about a conversation with a group I had uh, where that very issue was raised. So I put this picture up um, and it was a mixed group. You know, it was adult learners. We had, it was, an, it was a, a medical education group. So it was all medical faculty, but they were across really different domains in medicine. There were dental educators, there were, you know, residency directors. Um, there was a somebody from biotech there was it was a it was a quite a mixed group but immediately the first comment made somebody referred to the man in the wheelchair so um and i could feel this like ripple of like cringe go through the group of and, and even in myself like people who know that no this is not a man this is a woman this is an artist frida Kahlo. But this person raised the issue of like the masculinity that we see presented in this picture. And so um, 
you know, I, I just fielded the question. I use a teaching method called visual thinking strategies, which is an awesome method for leading a group through an open-ended discussion that is always going to be evidence-based. So I just simply fielded the comment according to the process. And I said, what do you, you know, we're looking at a figure appears to be possibly a man in a wheelchair. What do you see that makes you say it might be a man? And so we explored that. And then somebody else came in and said, well, I, I think I actually know something about this painting or this artist. I think it's a woman. I think it's Frida Kahlo. The group totally like worked it out and we kept going. We didn't get hung up on if it's a man or a woman, but, um, but that seed had been planted that then allowed us to kind of, exp you know, just open up this discussion around like how she painted herself and the sort of fearlessness in um, putting the unibrow in and the boldness of the hair and the strength um, and these sort of masculine qualities that might not have come up if somebody who had known all about Frida might not have suggested. As the conversation went on, we explored a lot of different things. One of the things that groups always touch on is like, what is she holding in her hands? And right, it's this like incredible shape that's part painter's palette and part anatomical heart, her heart outside of her body, you know, in her hand. Now, Frida Kahlo, you know, she went through hell. She was in a bus accident. She had a pole go through her vagina and like impale her insides. She had multiple surgeries, a broken pelvis. She couldn't have children. She was deeply brokenhearted about it. She made art, made art, made art all the way through, was a passionate person living in a lot of pain. And like, I always, there's something about the way in which uh, she's cradling that heart and at the same time staying resolute and calm that just uh, is humbling. Uh, but our conversation went on. We talked about, you know, like, who is that person in the portrait? And we've got these a, sort of a picture within a picture and these different worlds. And there's this resemblance between who's in the portrait and her. And at the same time, you know, they're different sizes. They're actually painted in different ways. What's the relationship between them? And then at the end of the conversation, the same person who had made the comment about her being a man at the beginning, who was now you know, an expert with like 20 minutes of rigorous engagement with this work under her belt. She said, you know, and she's a clinician, keep in mind. She said, you know, when I look at the way she's seated in that wheelchair, she looks so strong and upright. I just don't even think she needs the wheelchair. When I look at that person as if they're a patient, I just think that person is not sick. And I will always remember that moment because I know a lot about Frida Kahlo. I wouldn't call myself an expert by any stretch of the you know, imagination, but I, I've learned a lot about her in art history classes and over the years and working in museums. I would never question, does Frida Kahlo need a wheelchair? Because of my expertise, I have a blind spot there. And when that non-expert made that comment, I was like, oh my God, she's totally right. And it expanded my sense of Frida Kahlo as a person and as an artist. Like, I love it that she painted herself that way and that that could be recognized. And so when I think about that anecdote, it relates really beautifully. I mean, there are plenty of stories in medicine. Um, and this is something that very seasoned clinicians, when they teach, they advocate for their, pay, for their students to be aware of, to not let the blind spots of your expertise cloud your judgment. So I have a, a story about that from a colleague at the University of Minnesota, who's a pediatrician. Um, and this is a, I'm going to like read from some, he, well, I, I have it in front of me, but it's something he sent me just along this line. Seeing an elderly woman patient who had tonsilloid cancer, and she'd had previous radiation to her throat, and she came in because she had difficulty swallowing, and he was just convinced it was due to the radiation, just irritation. And so uh, she'd had a feeding tube, and you know it all lined up. It made perfect sense as to why she might have difficulty swallowing. And he wasn't concerned about anything else. He was about to discharge her, 
And then um, a, a dental resident who happened to be rotating in sort of quietly came up to him and said, you know, I, I just sat with her and I asked her about her difficulty swallowing. And it, st it started before she had the cancer. And he asked how he had found that out. And it was, uh, he said he simply noticed that her eyes were dry. And he just asked her about that. And it turned out that the difficulty swallowing came about right around the same time as her eye dry, her, her, the dryness of her eyes began, um, all of which was before the cancer had begun. And so it turned out that she had a collection of symptoms that were for an autoimmune disease that had been gone undiagnosed called scleroderma. And they wouldn't have tapped that ex except for, it just simply took a non-expert who was curious and noticed one thing and asked about it for that to be revealed. And so for me, that's like the medical parallel of Frida Kahlo not needing a wheelchair. And just the last thing on that is that, you know, medicine is a, is a space in which knowledge is king. It really organizes the hierarchy and who, who is deemed smart and knowledgeable and not, and sort of who gets to contribute um, meaning to a situation and who doesn't. And that, that's for good reason. I mean, there, but it, it's also not working and it's inhibiting communication. And um, there's like a need to sort of be able to transcend and, and work within the structures of the hierarchy to actually be able to share what people see and no. And when that can't happen, when that's too blocked, um, the, the situations can become quickly very dangerous. So um, it's just worth pointing that out. It's not just like a beautiful little, you know, parallel, but it's actually um, something that becomes a safety issue. You mentioned the variety of your audience. Does your teaching work better in specific fields of healthcare? I think it does. Yes. I, th I think there are certain domains in healthcare where it's much more, uh, has much more significance and traction than others, especially I would say pediatrics, family medicine, internal medicine, dermatology, areas that where seeing and being present with the patient are like a primary source of information gathering nursing um, and where the physician's uh, critical thinking skills and ability to trust and communicate with others are really important. Thanks, Alexa. It was important to understand in details how art can be beneficial beyond what we expect. But we are reaching the very end of the show. So I'll jump directly to my ultimate question. Is there an artwork that for you reflects the time we are currently living? That's a great question. And uh, it's such a mix right now of incredible evidence of progress and self-mastery and love and organization. And at the same time, cruelty and stuckness in the past and attachment to power that hurts people. And I can't think of any one work of art that really sums that up for me but at, you know when you asked me that i did i did send you no matter how raggly the flag it's still got to tie us together by thornton dial which is um, a construction that he made in 2003 and it's on view at the indianapolis museum of art i've actually never seen it in person but i've always wanted to so i this is obviously a an america centric work of art and doesn't speak to what's happening globally right now, but it's very much on my mind. I'm, I'm so moved. When I look closely at this work of art, I feel like a sinking feeling and at the same time, very moved and encouraged. And I feel like the love for this idea of freedom. And I see the, the blood that it comes with and um, I see what a mess it is. And it's also something that we all deeply love and crave and is ostensibly 
what this country is about and it's our work to actualize it on that promise. And that is deeply painful work that could tear us apart and we have to find it in ourselves to allow it to bring us together. And so for me, this work is like a very visceral representation of how brutal and deep and messy that is and also how loving and really our only choice uh, that is. So um, that speaks to me very deeply right now. Alexa, thank you so much for opening up this way and for bringing another perspective on art. We wish you all the best. Thank you so much, Pierre, and thank you for your questions and I wish you well as well. Bye, Alexa. Bye-bye, Pierre. Thank you for listening to this episode of Art Goes On. If you liked what you heard, feel free to follow and share the show on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on YouTube. Leave a rating or review to help people find the show. Thanks again. Thank you.